Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 here in our home city of New York. But our goal at our conferences and on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Justin uh, Fishner wolfson to SALT Talks. Justin is the founder and managing partner of 137 Ventures. Previously, he worked on the investment team at Founders Fund, uh, a leading venture capital fund as well. He was also selected as a Kaufman Fellow which is a program responsible for the development of leaders in global innovation and the venture capital industry. Justin graduated from Stanford University with honors, received a BS in management science and engineering and a master's in computer science and was a Mayfield fellow. Today, he resides in the beautiful city of Las Vegas, the fast growing city of Las Vegas, I should add as well. He's not like all those founders fund guys who have moved to Miami, uh, but has found another great home there in Las Vegas. I'm going to be hosting today's SALT Talk again, uh, John Darcy. In addition to my role as the Managing Director of SALT, I am also a uh, Director of Business Development at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm with about $8 billion in capital under management, primarily working in the fund-to-funds industry, but also engaged in some of the secondary market investing in the tech sector uh, that Justin has sort of pioneered. Uh, but Justin, we're very excited to have you here on SALT Talks. We like to start all of our conversations. I read a little bit about your bio, but would love to hear a little bit more about your background, how you decided to go to Stanford, uh, how you got into venture capital, and what you learned from experiences at places like Founders Fund that led you uh, to start your own firm, 137 Ventures. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for thanks for having me. I mean, I, I think Stanford is, you know, it, it is kind of the start of everything, at least for me. It's obviously a great school, but, you know, I think the fact that I ended up there is substantially the reason why I ended up in you know technology and venture capital. If you look back at Founders Fund, right, Peter, you know Peter Thiel and and Ken Howery, who you know they were both Stanford alums, and that was ultimately kind of the original connection to those guys. And you know how I ended up at Founders Fund, kind of at that beginning stage when you know they were making that transition to be an institutional venture firm. So it was kind of like. You know, Stanford is the nexus for a lot of things out, you know, in technology in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley. And so, you know, that's that's kind of a major reason why I ended up doing what I am doing today. Very cool. And as I mentioned, you spent time at Founders Fund, but you quickly identified an opportunity that you thought was too compelling uh, not to pursue. You started your own firm, 137 Ventures. Before we get into what you do at 137 Ventures, I'd like to talk about how you came up with the name, which I thought is a very interesting backstory. So, so what is the significance of the number 137 and the name of your company, 137 Ventures? The, the background is, you know, my grandfather used to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, probably not too far from your offices would be my guess. And, you know, that was his enunciator number, you know, when he was there. And so they used to signal the traders on the floor with, you know, uh, basically a, a train board. And, and so that was, that was how we named the firm. Right. And there, there's other, uh, you know, numerology involved with 137 uh, that I was reading about that, that you guys came up with that, that holds a lot of significance as well, right? It, it turns out it's one of those numbers that's like somewhat interesting. And when you talk to engineers, which, you know, I tend to do on a regular basis, people will, you know, ask you all sorts of things like, oh, is that the fine, is that because it's fine structure constant or other things like that? So, you know, you talk to people and you, you find out more and more interesting things about numbers over time. Right. And 137 Ventures, that opportunity set that I was alluding to earlier, is you provide, uh, you're a leading provider of customized liquidity solutions to founders, investors, and early employees of growth stage uh, private technology companies. So you're going to, again, early employees or, or founders or even funds that have invested in some of these leading tech companies and saying, hey, we have a better solution for you than waiting for an IPO or even traditional secondary market sales. So what are those sort of unique liquidity solutions that you provide look like? Uh, how are they different from traditional secondary sales? And how's your strategy differentiated within the venture world? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of questions there to unpack. I mean, at, at a basic level, and this even goes back to you know, my time at Founders Fund, we had a very clear belief that liquidity aligns incentives 
for bigger outcomes. And so if you look at how the industry has sort of evolved, you know, fund size have gotten bigger, you know, company outcomes have gotten bigger. And the thing that, you know, what you don't want to have as an investor is companies sell early, right? So if you have these really powerful compounding companies that can grow to be, you know, 10, 20, $100 billion outcomes, you don't want to see them ultimately sell the business for, you know, maybe a lot of money, but not ultimately, you know, the, the potential of what that business could be. And the challenge you have is, you know, as an investor, you have a portfolio of lots of companies. And so you're willing to take perhaps more risk uh, on any individual company. And if you're a founder of, of a startup, you any of these potential outcomes, right, if there's a large acquisition, mean a lot of, you know, really life-changing money to folks. And, you know, the insight was, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not like a magical insight. It's simply that, you know, people are willing to take more risk if, you know, they're less worried about their individual financial situation. And so if you provide people some amount of liquidity, by no means anything close to what they would get upon an exit, they're ultimately much more interested in getting, getting to much bigger stages. And so you drive much better fund level returns. And so I think there's a real alignment of incentives between, you know, founders, executives, and venture investors to provide liquidity, especially as companies have stayed private for much longer periods of time than they have in the past. Right. And and do you feel, like you said, you feel like decision-making at the company level improves as people have different liquidity options? Uh, why, why is that attractive, you know, for the investor set to provide those types of liquidity solutions to early uh, founders and employees? I, I mean, it varies, right? So, I mean, we've literally done business with people who are paying off student loans. I, I don't necessarily think it's a great use of you know, management's time to be concerned about whether or not they can afford to service their student loan debt, right? right. These, you know, the salaries in the industry, broadly speaking, aren't particularly high, right? People do own, you know, large equity positions, but you don't want them worried, you know, if they're going to be able to pay the dinner bill. There are people that, you know, have obviously gotten married, you know, they, they might have a kid. They don't necessarily want to live with roommates, right? The San Francisco is expensive. New York is expensive. And, you know, these are, I think, reasonable things that allow people to be more productive, at work. And so I think that's that's a good use of time and money. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been this massive explosion in private secondary market activity uh, at Skybridge. We're involved in the space. You know, it's, it's public and we can disclose the fact that we've invested in a handful of growth stage uh, fintech companies, including uh, Klarna and, and uh, Chime being examples uh, that we both invested in our funds and raised SPVs for some of our our uh, key relationships to invest in those products. Do you worry at all that, that secondary market valuations are getting you know, more expensive and sort of taking some of the meat off the bone? You know, we, we've seen IPOs sort of act as liquidity events, uh, you know, not, not particularly great entry points in some cases, certainly not the case for a lot of names in the last 18 months. But do you worry generally about secondary market at private valuations getting to a point where, where the opportunity set isn't quite as attractive? I mean, I think the relationship between, you know, secondary prices and, and primary prices, I mean, they're highly correlated, obviously, right? So if companies are, you know, raising money at, you know, at, at some valuation, that's going to affect, you know, people's perception of what the company is worth, and that's going to find its way into the secondary market. I mean, in terms of your question, I think is, so therefore, it's sort of broadly a valuation question, right? Are companies, you know, more expensive today, you know, than they were in the past. And I think on average, that's that's probably correct. If you look at the multiples that people are, are ascribing to a lot of the companies that you're talking about, but averages hide very important data. And so there's going to be companies that are above that average. There are going to be companies that are below that average. And I think for ourselves, we're trying to find companies that are you know, reasonably priced given the fundamentals of the business. And you're looking for very high growth because the one thing that broadly speaking makes up for valuation mistakes is very high growth because you can survive multiple compression in that situation. Right. So that's a good segue. And you touched a little bit on it in that answer, but what characteristics in terms of levels of growth, levels of maturity and other aspects do you look for when you're identifying growth stage investments uh, to offer these types of liquidity solutions? And most of our portfolio is growing, you know, probably hundred percent or higher, right? I mean, that's, that's a large portion of the portfolio, especially when we're making initial investments in things. And what we care about in particular is trying to identify businesses that have some kind of long-term defensibility. You know, one of the challenges, you know, in the, in the world as a whole is, you know, there, there's a lot of capital out there. And so you know, what you don't want to have is invest in, you know, potentially a really great business, have other people notice that it's a really great business, and then have people fund 
those other fast followers and compete margins away, which then will result in multiples compressing. And so we're looking for businesses that we think have business models that are defensible. And you think it, you know, these are well understood concepts, you know, network effects, information asymmetries, economies of scale, things that make it, you know, that that allow businesses to maintain their margin profile over an extended period of time. Are there certain sectors that you think more often embody those characteristics that you've been drawn to over the years? Or is it is it pretty broad and you guys cover a wide variety of sectors? Yeah, I mean, I think we cover a very large number of sectors. I mean, obviously, I think we're, we're well known for the SpaceX investment, but, you know, you look at marketplaces. I mean, you could be an Airbnb or you could be in WorkRise. I mean, they're, they're very different marketplaces, but yet those marketplaces have very similar dynamics. There's right. a lot of, you know, information asymmetries in enterprise businesses, right? So, for example, you know, Gusto is providing payroll and benefits to small, medium-sized businesses, but then they're rolling out financial services for consumers, who are, you know, another name for consumers are employees of small and medium-sized businesses. And so they can leverage that data to, you know, reduce the costs for people, right? And I think that's that's a very interesting value proposition. Right. So you can see this in a lot of different industries. Right. And, you know, you, you primarily do these uh, customized liquidity solutions uh, in the secondary market, but you do sometimes participate in primary funding rounds. How do you determine uh, when you want to participate in a primary round versus focusing on, on secondaries? I think what we do in the, in the secondary market is, you know, it's, it's more differentiated. There are fewer people who do what we do. You know, there are obviously uh, many people who are primary investors. So, you know, we're, we're more agnostic as to how we're participating. It's simply that there are fewer people who provide structured transactions in the secondary market. So right. we're happy to use that as, you know, a, a, a better wedge to get into companies that we think are compelling. But fundamentally, between those two opportunities, we're not going to say no to a company that we're very excited about. Right. And you mentioned SpaceX before. It's one thing that, that 137 Ventures is very well known for. When you were at Founders Fund, you played a significant role, from my understanding, in uh, having Founders Fund increase its allocation to SpaceX. At 137, you've accumulated a significant position in SpaceX. What about SpaceX got you so excited? And what is the opportunity set in space? Obviously, we've seen a lot of uh, public relations around space recently with Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic uh, going up into space, Jeff Bezos uh, outdoing him by a couple hundred thousand uh, feet f- from what I remember. Uh, yeah. But but uh, obviously, SpaceX has been on fire in terms of the launch of the Starlink network, as well as its NASA missions. So just what is the market? How big is it? You know, And is it more based on tourism? Is it more based on industrial uh, capabilities? Uh, but but what does the market look like in space? I think the joke is that it's expanding, right? <laughs> um, but you look at you look at Bezos, you look at what Branson's is doing. I, mean, I think it's great that they're getting people excited about space. I mean, if you think back to you know putting a man on the moon, I think it was a great unifying thing for the country. It was an exciting thing and had a lot of really important you know scientific discoveries that ultimately translated into people's lives. I mean, like Velcro, right? I mean, like things that people don't necessarily think of that came from from these developments. So, I mean, I think it's great what what everyone is doing. I mean, SpaceX, for the most part, is is really in a different business. So, you know, you look at launch, I mean, the things that matter, you know, in the world is it's like all the Earth observation satellites, GPS, the things that really keep modern society working, like this all floats above us in space. And so SpaceX's launch capabilities are, are really second to none. I mean, they've built, you know, very, very reliable, reusable rockets in a way that really no one imagined even five years ago. So I think that's been a real transformation. You mentioned Starlink, you know, they're on basically the verge and this is all gonna change, you know, become I think very clear to everyone over the next six to 12 months that anywhere on earth you can get high speed, low latency internet. As long as you have power and you can see the sky, like the internet will be available to you. And that's an incredible change as opposed to having to dig fiber right. in lots of very difficult, expensive places. So that's that's just like one example of how I mean, yes, it's about space, but really it's providing internet service. And so right. there's all sorts of interesting things that are going to happen from this. Yeah, you know, Starlink uh, is particularly interesting to me. Obviously, the reusable rockets are a massive innovation and SpaceX is at the vanguard of, of so much uh, you know, great innovation that's taking place related to space. But Starlink has a very clear addressable market. Uh, just how much is it going to disrupt traditional telecom? I mean, I live today in Long Island when I'm taking the Long Island Railroad home. There's long patches of the train ride where I don't get cell service. 
the house I grew up in in the Raleigh Durham area in North Carolina, we struggle to get reliable, uh, you know, internet and and phone service. There's massive swaths of not just the United States, but obviously around the world. Just how big is that market that Starlink is addressing, and how big can that business be? I think the market is actually huge, but it's it's really not targeted towards the urban centers, right? Because they're building a network that functionally covers the entire globe, they're really going after, in some sense, the places that the traditional incumbents have ignored. And the reason that they've mostly ignored them is that it's very expensive to provide service there. And so what Starlink changes is all the places that used to be very hard to provide service are now the same as any place that was easy to provide service. And so sure, they're going to pick off you know, whatever, they'll, they'll have some customers in Manhattan, but they're also going to have customers in lots of rural geographies in the U.S. There are many underserved populations, whether or not it's some of the, you know, Native American tribes that have traditionally and historically been underserved by all of these players. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of places that this now becomes easy and the market's huge. I mean, if you look at some of the data coming from the U.S. government, there are tens of millions of Americans who don't have access to high speed internet. And that's just, we're just talking about America. Like this is a global network. So you start talking about Europe and Africa and I mean, Asia, I mean, e- everywhere in the world can be served by this network. And so I think it's very understandable how they get to, you know, multiple millions, if not tens of millions within the next few years of subscribers. Right. Yeah. I mean, it could fundamentally change society. We've seen this redistribution geographically within the United States and in, in some cases around the world of working populations and, and some exodus out of the Bay Area and, and places like that, because people realize they can they can work effectively uh, in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So it'll be interesting to see how, how uh, Starlink sort of affects society in that way. But uh, I want to talk about exits. So uh, when you're involved in private companies, they IPO, there's often an IPO pop or they rally in the first few months after they go public. And you know, obviously, there's a different life cycle to every investment. But as you look at exiting these positions, is this something where you take it on a, a company by company basis in terms of evaluating your exit? Do you look to have a, a specific plan with every one of your investments after they get public liquidity? Or how do you look at exiting these positions? And we certainly think about things on a company by company basis, right? The, the facts may always lead you to kind of a different conclusion. But you know, because we're trying to invest in companies that we think can compound for extended periods of time, you know, the, the private to public transition is more of a, a, you know, an evolution of the company. It doesn't change the fundamental business that they're in. And so, you know, while that is an opportunity for us to get liquidity for our investors, and we obviously care about that because, you know, funds, you know, venture is a long business. Um, it, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that there's something magical that happens upon an IPO that suddenly means you you don't like the business anymore. It's it's simply a point where it's easier to get liquidity. And I think just as a as a vague side note that I, that I think is a little bit funny, if you think about the public markets, you know, 99.999% of all transactions are secondary, right? In fact, the public markets kind of think primary is a, is a weird thing, right? They don't, it doesn't happen that often. And generally right. they're sort of against it when companies try to raise more money. Um, you know, and it's exactly the exact opposite in, in the private markets, right? Primary is sort of the normal and, and secondary is a little weird. I, I just always thought this distinction was somewhat funny. And I think it's the same thing. It's like when there's an IPO transition, it doesn't actually mean that anything about the company has changed, except that the shares are now easier to trade, right? That, that's all that right. really happened. Yeah. And I mentioned sort of first day pops or, or recent rallies that we've seen post IPO in some big tech companies, several of which you've had exposure to including Palantir, Airbnb, uh, DoorDash is another one that had a significant rally and they've sort of, you know, certainly paired their gains uh, in subsequent months. But in your view, why are we seeing in some cases such volatility or such ferocious rallies post IPO? Is this a matter of bankers mispricing the deal? Is it a matter of sort of strategically uh, creating the right size float? Or why why do you think we're seeing sort of asymmetries in how companies react uh, once they enter public life? I think it's it's hard to know you know what the right price is and what I've what I've realized you know having kind of thought about this you know over all these liquidity events relatively recently is you know the amount of information that people get when they're investing in a private company is so much larger than what public markets investors receive. I mean, if, if you go public, you you put out an S one, you know, you do some investor meetings, you go on a roadshow, whatever. Um, you know, maybe you're going to put out some quarterly information, but it, most private investors would say, well, where's the rest of the diligence packet? 
right? And while I certainly think you can be a well-informed public markets investor, I think what people are doing is they're taking, you know, earnings calls over every quarter, they're building some trend lines, they're building their own models, and they're refining that over time. And I think to look at a company on an IPO and think that all the public markets guys are not only going to get it right, but even have all the information to get it right within right. a day. It, I mean, that's just, a, that, I mean, that seems very hard to imagine and to expect of people. So you're going to see volatility, obviously, as over time, people understand these businesses better and better. And then I think you'll find out what the real prices for all these companies are. And sometimes, you know, the market's going to be high and sometimes the market's going to be low and eventually it will be correct. Um, but eventually it could be a while from now. Right. Are there any other companies, obviously you've, you've been involved with and exited a lot of extremely exciting tech companies. Are there any in particular today, uh, whether it be, you could talk sectors, you could talk individual names that you are most excited about in today's market in sort of a post pandemic world. Obviously the world has been shaken up by everything we've seen in the last 18 months. Are there any sort of theses that you've grown even more excited about? The thing that I've been pleasantly surprised that we've seen play out in our portfolio, but I think has been true more broadly is there's just been this massive acceleration of tech adoption. And so things that we thought were going to take, you know, five, 10 years, all got adopted in, in 12 months. And a lot of the companies also that we thought, you know, had the potential to be really impacted by the pandemic. Think of Flexport, right? You know, global, you know, is global trade going to be what it, what it was? And then it turned out that, you know, shipping was really hard. Logistics were really hard. There were major constraints on the system. Prices went up and, you know, Flexport really shined because they had much better software for their customers. They were able to get more things done. They were able to allow people to plan as well as anybody could in that environment. Even Gusto, right? Like this, they're, they're dealing with small and medium sized businesses in the US. And, you know, we obviously were somewhat concerned because those were some of the most impacted businesses. But you saw, you know, relatively quickly that, you know, their business was going to be okay. They did a lot of great things to help people, you know, help their customers, you know, apply for PPP loans and kept a lot of people in business that I think would have otherwise struggled to deal with the government. There were some good programs, but it wasn't, it's never, it's never that easy, you know, dealing with the government and filling out all the paperwork correctly and making right. sure that things happen. So I was, you know, pleasantly surprised with, you know, how all of our companies, you know, reacted to the pandemic. And then ultimately, broadly speaking, how they benefited from, you know, that adoption cycle that, that we're going through right now. Right. We, we had a great salt talk a couple of months ago with Michael Moe, uh, obviously a pioneer in ed tech, sure. uh, talking about education. You guys have a position in a, in a company called Course Hero. We talked about Starlink in terms of leveling the playing field in, in terms of access to broadband and things like that. How do you think education is going to evolve uh, as a result of the pandemic and even trends that we were seeing before the pandemic in terms of, you know, you have this, this great piece of paper that's extremely valuable and the network you built from that piece of paper at Stanford is, is certainly probably even more valuable uh, than the paper itself. But how do you think, you know, given the, the massive rise in cost of education, this huge differential in the quality of education you can get in, surf, in, in certain locations, how do you think technology is going to affect that? And do you think you know, the pandemic sort of accelerated some of that change in terms of democratizing access to quality education? I think it's been a mixed bag. Um, I mean, you mentioned Starlink, and, and a lot of this stuff really is the internet, right? So Starlink bringing these, bringing the internet to people that didn't have it is so important because the internet is not just education; it's also healthcare, right? It's also jobs. So you know, all these things are related, but specifically in education, right? People, you know, government sent kids home from school and said, well, you can learn online, except there were many, many kids in the U.S. and throughout the world who didn't have access to internet that was fast enough to do that. They didn't have access to computers or tablets that they could use to actually you know, go through classes. So I think it's been a mixed bag, but it does bring with it the potential, and I think more people are focused on this, where you, know, you, can, you really can do more and more of these things on the internet, and bridging that digital divide, I think, is more important. And I think it was always something people thought about, and now they understand that you can bring everyone kind of into the into the mainstream economy if you can give them internet service and the resources to learn, get healthcare. I mean, even our healthcare investments, all these direct consumer healthcare businesses, like Curology, 30 Madison, the Pill Club. I mean, you don't need to go to doctors for a lot of things, right? You, you can deal with that stuff remotely. And I think that's very yeah. exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about mobility for a second. So you have several investments in the mobility space, ranging from scooters to car sharing, 
Uh, and you know, you even had an investment in DD, the Chinese ride sharing company. How do you think, whether it's pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, how do you think mobility is evolving and what will that look like in 10 years? And how does, how does your uh, investment portfolio within the mobility space reflect your views on that market? I mean, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. I mean, obviously the pandemic shut down mobility in a very broad sense, substantially. So that affected different people's businesses in, in better or worse ways. But I do think that the underlying trend of you know, people not needing to own really large, really expensive app, you know, assets makes sense, right? So like that part of the business, I don't think it's going away. I think there's broadly speaking, the standard trend towards urbanization. So all of these you know, business models make a ton of sense. Obviously the pandemic was very disruptive, but you've seen them quite frankly, it, to my earlier point, they bounced back much faster than even I would have expected. You know, if you would have asked me last year to, you know, to look at what's going on with Turo or, you know, get around or Uber, or any of these companies, like the businesses have really bounced back in a way that I, I'm, I gotta say, I was somewhat surprised. Right. You have an investment in a company called Planet that takes pictures of the earth every day. And I've talked with, with some other investors who, who have uh, investments in Planet and, and some similar type ventures, but uh, Planet and other uh, satellite photograph services recently discovered the Chinese were building uh, new missile silos, nuclear missile silos in certain parts of the country. What uh, what has Planet and other companies of its type made possible in terms of how we're able to monitor what's going on around the world and how are people using that data in creative ways? I mean, these things were never possible before all of the cost reductions in both launch and satellite. And I think that that's what's enabling this, this new generation of technologies to do what you're describing, where planet really can take a picture of any spot on earth, you know, on a continuous basis once a day. And when you can start to see that, you can understand what, ch what change is happening. And I think that's really the interesting thing. So you can see what's happening in the rainforest. You can see what's happening in China. You can see, you know, and that helps for disaster management, right? Obviously, if you're, you know, if there's been a natural disaster, knowing what's changed on the ground could be incredibly helpful to, you know, all of the workers who are trying to get to people. So like, it, it shows up in all sorts of interesting ways, whether or not it's farming, whether or not it's environmental, whether or not it's disaster response. And it only works if, you know, it's, it's economically possible, right? I mean, the, the US government used to do these things, and they could you know, they could task a satellite and look at something once in a while. And that was an incredible change from what it was before. And you're just sort of seeing the, the cost curve come down on all electronics. And if you can launch things pretty cheaply, you can replace the electronics on a regular basis, which means you're always using the latest and greatest. So you you also have, in terms of the, de the defense sector, you have an investment in a company called Andoril. Uh, that uh, is is developing all kinds of novel technologies around defense uh, that that is certainly courting uh, government contracts and things like that. How are they taking an approach that's disrupting sort of traditional uh, defense companies and contractors? I mean, I think they're following sort of in the footsteps of you know what SpaceX and Palantir you know have have sort of pushed the government towards, which is that you don't need to always specify everything that you want and then have people build it for you custom. There are things that can be commercially viable that make it less expensive and it can just be, you know, you can buy products off the shelves, right? And I think that it's it's this, this change from cost plus manufacturing as a business and a mindset to we're gonna build products that solve a problem that, you know, has a certain value to people. And if we can do that well, then we've got a really great business. And I think it's a good change for the government to, you know, buy, off the shelf products based on their value and not, you know, try to design everything themselves. I think that's a very hard problem. And I think for unique stuff, it totally makes sense. You know, when you're sending a man to the moon, no one knows how much that costs, right? We've never done it before, but you know, it, it, it's been a long time. And, you know, after 40, 50 years, like we should find a commercial solution to this stuff. Right. We know how to do it now. It's just a matter of being able to do it efficiently a high number of times. I look at, I mean, look at smartphones, right? I mean, it, it, you don't need to specify this Apple and, you know, Samsung, these guys are going to keep making, that they're going to keep improving these products and they're going to sell hundreds of millions of them. And that's what's going to drive the cost down for everybody, including the government. Right. You know, we, we talked a little earlier about your time at Founders Fund, Peter Thiel, obviously, uh, sort of the 
the most prominent uh, partner there at Founders Fund. Obviously, he's not the only one making decisions, but you know, he he has sort of a libertarian uh, view of the world. He believes that that uh, you know, private sector has the ability to uh, produce things, including things that you're talking about with Anduril, more efficiently. What's your view of the world in terms of how public and private work together? You touched on it a little bit. Uh, talking about you know defense companies and and space companies and things like that, but but what did you take away from your time working with Peter at Founders Fund, and do you share any of his his worldview on that side of things? I, I mean, obviously, took a lot of things away from you know my time at Founders Fund, you know my time with with Peter. I think you know we share similar views of you know what companies are interesting, what companies are defensible, what companies will ultimately you know be incredibly valuable businesses. So I think a lot of that. Is the same. I mean, my views would be there are market solutions work for a lot of things, and that ends up being better, faster, cheaper for everyone. I mean, obviously, there are there are values to the government. There are things that the private sector is not going to do. Um, but we should figure out what you know where those lines are, and they actually they constantly move. And the more things the government doesn't have to do, I think those things are better served by by the by private businesses by the market. Right. And and last question I want to ask you before we let you go re- relates to geography. So, you know, you had an investment in DD that, that I alluded to earlier. There's been a lot made of China's crackdown on tech, starting with Alibaba through to Tencent, now uh, DD delisting it from the App Store. Uh, we, we could talk about China as its own distinct entity. You know, how are you looking at allocating tech capital to China? We had some deals come across our desk, uh, you know, based in China that we certainly took a hard look at, but but uh, had reservations about. Uh, how do you look at China? And then geographically, are you focused on the United States or how do you look at places like Europe, places like you know, emerging markets, whether it be Africa, Southeast Asia, geographically, where are you focusing your investments and how do you, how do you think about geography? And for us, we've always been focused on the US. The vast majority of our investments are here. Partially, that's just driven by we're a relatively small organization and this is where you know, our networks and our relationships are. And it's, you know, it's obviously the place that we understand the best. We've been willing to invest internationally. I mean, obviously you mentioned the DD investment, we invested in Spotify. You know, so we've, we've managed, you know, we've been willing to invest elsewhere. Broadly speaking, that's when we've, you know, had a very good relationship with the company. We've had friends who, you know, have brought us into opportunities. So we feel comfortable with, you know, why we're seeing them in the first place. Uh, China is, you know, it's its own, it's its own unique place, right? In, in a way that I think, you know, India is also its own unique place, right? Europe is different than the US, but, you know, we share a lot more similarities. The markets are a little bit, you know, more structurally similar. So we're, we're totally open to investing internationally, but we're somewhat hesitant to do it in place, you know, just because we don't know those areas as well. And so we will generally speaking do that when we feel, you know, we, we've got some friends around the table that make us feel more comfortable. All right, Justin. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Congratulations on on what you've built at 137 Ventures. Uh, I think you have an incredibly exciting portfolio. You've obviously exited a lot of uh, you know the hottest tech companies that we've seen uh, come to market in the last five to 10 years. And, and uh, best of luck with all your future growth. Thank you. Very nice talking with you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's Salt Talk with Justin fishner wolfson of 137 Ventures. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT talks, you can access them all on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called SALT2. Uh, We're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at SALT Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these SALT talks. We think people like Justin providing incredible access uh, to private market opportunities that a lot of investors didn't have access to uh, when Justin started doing what he's doing. Uh, So thankful for for, uh, people like him and how he's opened up these markets. But on behalf of uh, the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. 